there. We are here today to talk about your favorite health and wellness topics. I'm here with my dad, Dr. Furman. And I'm here with my daughter, Jenna. And welcome to the Eat to Live podcast. We are here today to talk about intermittent fasting, water fasting, and intuitive eating. So let's dive in. All right. Well, you know, I've even written a book on fasting. Don't tell me what it's called. Wait. Okay, not to seize proof your child. That was an early one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Fasting and eating for health. Correct. Okay. Yes. Whew. Do you know how many years ago that was written? Um, I believe that book was written in 2001. No, in 1994 or 96. No way. Yeah. Oh, wow. So written, that was your first book written, ever. Written more than 25 years ago. It wasn't fasting truly the first introduction into the medical world, the health world for you as well? Well, you know what it was is that I wanted to write a book about eating for health, but the publisher really wanted fasting to be number one in the title because there were no books out about fasting. Oh. They wanted to make it unique and they wanted it to be searchable in the, you know, in libraries and things. So it's called fasting and eating for health because it had to do with eating healthy, but also about fasting as well. And fasting was intentionally made the first word in the title. That was my, obviously my first book, but. And ironic also that you had the experience because you had fasted as a teenager, right? I was 19 years old when I did my first fast. That's right. How did that go? Not that great. <laughs> really? Well, I fasted 10 days on water in when I was, because I couldn't walk from, my, from a skating injury because my heel wasn't getting better and I felt it might facilitate healing because I was a, um, an advocate of, on, I was a fan of Dr. Herbert Shelton reading all his works on nutrition and fasting as my, when I was a teenager. So let me get this straight. You had a physical injury yeah. and you wanted to get better really quick to compete. And so you thought fasting, like just from the research that you took in, you were like fasting could help me. Cause that's kind of a, that would be a revolutionary concept for me as a 19 year old. Yes. Um, well, I didn't start with that concept first. I just wasn't getting better. And then I was hospitalized at Lenox Hill hospital in New York. And the, the Joe, Joe Namath's doctor, the doctor of the jet, Jets, was sent to take care of me by the Olympic Committee. Because at that point, I was the number one ranked pair skater in the United States. Nice. And they wanted, I had to get back on the ice. So they, he came and tortured me by pushing into the pain areas. And, and it wasn't getting better. So he, then he came into the room and wanted to conduct some experimental surgery. Where he'd lacerate the area like a checkerboard to expedite healing. And it had, he wasn't, you know, there were calcifications, there was damage to the fat pad. It made no sense what he wanted to do. He, he saw me as a guinea pig and I saw he just had no care for me as for what my future would be. It was just a, a chance to do an, an experimental operation. So I just left, got out of the hospital and I decided then what was I going to do? I, I just thought maybe fasting might help. I ultimately I fasted 10 days at home on water and it didn't get better. So I went down to see Dr. Herbert, Dr. Shelton, who was, had Parkinson's then and was no longer in practice, and Dr. Vetrano, who took care of, was working at his facility, and I stayed in Texas for over a month. So I fasted a long time, the 10 days at home, I ate for a week, and then I went to Texas for more fasting. And I, Were you thinking then, because, I mean, assuming you wrote a book on fasting, or I know you wrote a book on fasting, therefore I'm assuming when you had this experience, you kind of saw the things you wanted to do differently or that you would tweak? Yes, I saw a lot of people who changed their diet and who fasted and recovered from serious illnesses. So I did see the powerful tool that fasting could be to facilitate people's recovery from serious illnesses. So my observation through the early natural hygienic practitioners, even as a teenager, helped um, stimulate and spur my passion to want to go into nutrition and to utilize nutritional excellence and fasting as therapeutic tools. But there's also, obviously, as a 19-year-old, you're not seeing some of the negative aspect of that. And for myself, I thought they fasted me in a way that was um, too long and irresponsibly. They fasted me so long, I don't know why they would fast me that long, but they made it so that they, I lost so much weight that, it, that I couldn't go back into serious competitive figure skating again within a, in, a, in a reasonable period of time because I had lost years and years of muscle and stamina from fasting that long. Right. Which nobody, they didn't, you know, I wasn't warned that that could happen. And so it still, it did make me able to walk, possibly walk quicker, but, you know, but um, my heel took, it's my heel still took years to be able to get better and never came back to totally to have a normal heel. So do you think fasting actually even helped that? Do I think it helped me that my heel? A physical injury. 
Well, my thought back then was that it would help absorb the calcifications in the heel that was, you know, nowadays we have like extracorporal shockwave to break up calcians and joints and we can, we can heal things. I thought by fasting it may absorb the calcified deformity there, but, um, but I'm not sure that, I'm not 100% sure that fasting facilitated my recovery or was just resting for a few months and then staying off my foot for a few months that enabled me to get back into training again. And I, I eventually got back into ice skating and, and was third in the prof world professional, but I had to miss making the Olympic team because that was in 74. I couldn't get back in good enough shape for the tryout nationals at, at, Colorado, at um, Colorado Springs. It was 6,000 feet at the Broadmoor at high altitude. My stamina wasn't good enough and my strength was under my par. So I did not make the, U the 76 Olympic team because of having fasted so long, I couldn't get back in shape for quick enough. So before we get into all the details of water fasting and who you actually do recommend it for, mm. I was just thinking about your muscle loss because I know you always talk about too with osteoporosis patients and all that stuff. I could see as a 19 year old that you could build that muscle back. It's not detrimental. But if you fast someone older, is there any hope to gain that muscle back and strength? Is that a concern? Yes. Well, that's those very prolonged fasts that I did. Could be one of the risks could be Loss. If you're fasting person to that long, you're going to lose significant amount of muscle and muscle and bone mass accordingly. And certainly, muscle strength and mass is one of the factors that leads to slower aging. And so, there's a, this is a, this is an art form now. The art form is to maintain this ideal weight, to stabilize your muscle and bone mass in a strong position, and then uh, certainly we know that episodically going fasting could slow aging and extend lifespan, but not so much fasting that you drop the weight to a weight to a point where you've developed weakened muscles and weakened bones. Mm. So that might mean a person could fast two or three days every couple of months because they only dropped the weight from 145 pound male down to 138 pounds. They didn't lose all the muscle and bone. And they drop go and they build back in the gym back to 145 pounds again. They didn't really drop down to 110 pounds or 100 pounds because then if because then at the age of 70 years old they're not going to build back that muscle mass. I'm seeing you it know? in my mind like a graph. There's like this red zone that's like don't go below here. Yes. And that's interesting though. So you would recommend fasting in a for a shorter time for like a day or two days for someone like me who just wants to do it for longevity? Yes, I think that's reasonable. In other words, the problem with fasting is that most people aren't like you. Most people are food, lot, I think the majority of people are food, have food addiction tendencies and have self-destructive behavior with food. They overeat and they eat the wrong food, both, right? Mm -hmm. And they're overweight. And the, the food they're eating, not their own fault, but the foods are designed to be addicting. You, they're hyper palatable, they're overly seasoned, you want them and your brain becomes kind of like attracted to them. So then if this person who's overweight fasts, there's more likely that fasting period makes them more obsessed with food. You're talking about using fasting as a tool perhaps for weight loss. Exactly. That's where it could be dangerous. It's not, it's not so dangerous, but it's not going to be effective. Because in, in the majority of cases, if we followed people who lost weight through fasting, over a period of years, one or two years, we'd find the majority of them gain the weight back or gain more weight back before they started fasting. The same concept as yo-yo dieting. It's, that's right, it's a form of yo-yo dieting and it's not the, it's not the most cons way to lead, lead to the highest probability of stabilizing your weight at the most favorable weight for your longevity. Because that takes long-term consistency and the develop uh, with healthy eating and losing your addiction and attraction for unhealthy food because you're staying off it for a long period of time to develop the taste muscle and the preference for healthy food. And you get the instinctual connection with the feeling of how much food is right for you. And you start to get in touch with the single signals of satiety because you're getting enough fiber, enough nutrients, getting the right amount of food volume, you're not overdoing calories. Yeah. And over a period of time, your body gets used to it. And then you can get connected with the natural cues for hunger. So you're eating when you're hungry and you're not eating when you're not, you're not no longer feel like you need to emotionally eat or eat for addictive withdrawal purposes. You're just eating because you're, you're feeling that you're eating the right amount of food. It's time for you to eat. And you're maintaining yourself at the healthiest weight, not too thin and not too heavy. Because you know, anorexics can get too thin for their ideal health. We want to be on the slim side, but not overly thin. So you have this person that does, I'm saying that I've learned over the decades of doing this as a career, that people are more likely to succeed if they learn the repetition over and over again of the correct behavior that they practice day in and day and night, as opposed to fasting, which derails them 
they start obsessing too often obsessing about food and then because they excessively slowed the metabolic rate down to an excessive degree during fasting, then when they go back to overeating a little bit even, they gain back their weight, it comes back too quick, and the yo-yo, the yo-yo dieting thing is that if you put back on the weight too quickly, your body can't put on muscle and bone, it's putting on more fat, and the, and the, and the rapid regain of weight could be saturated fat, and the yo-yo dieting could be so fasting, it could be not, say, not healthy for your long-term health. I've so also- fasting could be actually a negative longevity factor there, you know. I've also heard that fasting kills some hunger cues that you've might developed. So if you're used to a certain amount of food that you eat, eating no food, you might not know when you're hungry or not. You kind of have to, you think you're always hungry because when you're fasting, I assume you're really hungry. No. No? When you're hungry, if you have normal hunger cues before you go into a fast, Mm -hmm. when you start to go into ketosis and your brain learns how to use we're talking about total water fasting here. Okay. No calories coming in for right. a prolonged period of time. Right. It usually takes about 36 hours for a female and about 48 hours for a male for the brain to accept ketones, which is a breakdown product of fat as an alternative energy fuel. And that's called protein sparing. You're not going to burn down some muscle tissue because you, you, you can break down muscle tissue to make glucose for the brain. But the body doesn't want to wait. I need to take all this in. Mm-hmm. You go into ketosis, which, which takes 48 hours for a man, 36 hours for a woman. No. Oh. You go into ketosis, you start to make ketones earlier than that. Okay. But it takes the brain 36 hours for a female and 48 hours for a male to be able to accept ketones as a primary fuel. Because the brain, the ketones, the brain functions on glucose. But after not seeing glucose for a long enough period of time and being bathed with ketones, it starts to accept ketones to be able to burn ketones. So then they can muscle spare. Because the body can break down muscle tissue to make glucose but it can't make glucose from fat breakdown. So then we could not needle as much glucose by breaking down muscle, and the body could make ketones from fat, and you can conserve your muscle when you're fasting. So the body has built into it an instinctual mechanism to, stare, to spare muscle. So and get rid of the fat. And get rid of the fat during fasting. So after that time, you're, you're, what would make sense is that you get rid of that fat that inflamed tissue, essentially. Isn't that where infl- inflammation is stored in fat and you're saving that precious muscle? Yes, to th- that when you're overweight, because there's some degree of fat on the body that's normal. Right. right? And of if course. a woman doesn't have any fat, she's not going to be able to have children, not going to have normal, you know, she'll- It's also so, dangerous. It, right, so that could be, you know, you're going towards anorexic if your fat stores get too low, right? Sure. So you want that right amount of fat for a woman, maybe, let's just say, for example, it's between um, 18 and 25% body fat. Right. Okay. So as you go over than 25% body fat for a female, then you start to see the fat cells become more pro-inflammatory. Okay. So it's the excess fat over a certain baseline level of fat. And then the fat cells become more pro-inflammatory and they don't get a great blood supply to fuel that much fat. So the lack of blood supply, lack of oxygenation leads to more reactive oxygen species coming off the fat supply. We talked about those before in a podcast. Right. It's all come in full circle. Okay. So you get more production of inflammatory um, substances that then suppress immune function and increase risk of cancer from the excess fat, but not a normal amount of fat. Right. 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 Okay. But then fasting. um, Oh, so we were saying that the hunger... Um, goes away. By the time you go into ketosis on a fast, you were saying to me, then you lose your hunger. You're not hungry at all. Really? So you fat, yeah, no hunger at all. That's hard to believe. But, but you know, and the thing is, it takes, um, over time, we want people to be connected with hunger and we want them to eat, we want them to get hungry. Because if they're never getting hungry, they're chronically overeating. Right, But totally. we want them to get true hunger, which is felt here, not toxic hunger, which is weakness and fatigue and headache and stomach cramping. More so those detox That's symptoms. That's the detox symptoms. So those detox symptoms may happen during the fast, which people think is hunger, but they're really just detox from not, because the body is in an enhanced cleansing mode when you're not feeding it food. Right. So you reserve fasting as like a special tool in your belt to use for who? You said that, you know, for someone who's not a food addict and is healthy, you would use it for that extra level of longevity, not a long fast, a short water fast. Right. But what do you use it for? Well, that's right. I use it for as a therapeutic tool, as a healing modality for people with medical problems who need to fast. Like, let's say if you had asthma, right? And you required inhalers, steroids and Mm. beta agonist inhalers. And I had you eating right. And I was weaning you off the beta agonist, keeping you on the steroids first. But I'm afraid when I stop the steroids to win you down, you're going to start to have asthma attacks. Because the asthma attack itself is a detoxification crisis. 
Your body is throwing out waste products through the lung, tightens the lung up and makes you not breathe. The, you don't, the body doesn't know what's causing you not to breathe, it just thinks it's throwing waste out of the lung because the inflammatory response is one of the ways the body repairs and heals tissue. So the asthma attack is the detox, is the healing, and oh. the headache is the healing process. But we don't want to get this person to not to be able to breathe to kill, you know, we, the body doesn't know it's hurting itself by not having oxygen come in. It's right. just inflamed. It's dangerous. It could be dangerous, right? Sure. So therefore, when we're weaning the person off the steroids, um, but first we got them eating healthy for a year and really healthy, and they're not needing as much medication gradually. And then we, then we can start to reduce the medications to prevent them from going back into another asthma attack. We can start to put them on a fast and we stop the steroids. Because the fast has such a powerful anti-inflammatory effect and can accelerate detoxification channels to relieve the lung from being the, the area of, of inflammation, the source of inflammation, and then the person could breathe comfortably you're not, because when you starve the person, because just think about this, it's the, it's the overactive immune response that's causing the, the allergy or the allergic reaction or the asthma attack. So by fasting, you've kind of starved out the extra active immune response and you prevent the immune system from, act, from overly activating itself and causing an asthma um, an asthma attack or an asthma exacerbation. So now we fast this person, they're off their medications, and I've complete fasting them for two weeks or two and a half weeks on just water. Wow, that's a long time. Yeah, and then when we reintroduce food, it's a long enough period of time where they're no longer gonna have further their asthma attacks. So now they're eating healthy again, they detoxified long-term with a fast, and now I've cured this person of ever having asthma for the rest of their life if they stay eating healthily. Wow, so, so they're done with medication? They're done with medication. It, it, was, it gave me that extra tool I needed to complete the withdrawal from the steroids without facilitating, without me instigating another asthma attack again. Right. And like, let's say a person um, has lupus, for example, or mixed connective tissue disease, or a pro another inflammatory disease, fat, or psoriasis, Fasting can be utilized in the same way because in many cases, we're, they're on the diet for a period of time, they're coming off medications that are, that are dangerous and toxic, and then when we stop that medication, what are we gonna do when they start to flare up again or get mild disease back again? Because we're getting more off the medication, they're getting healthier, but maybe they're not, can't come off the medications all the way, that's where we'd start a fast. Stop the rest of the medication, start a fast, because the fast will stop them from having another attack and facilitate on a prolonged fast could be the, the, the um, point that enables us to transition to wellness without requiring medication. Help me, aids me in that, making that transition process for them. So I'm assuming these fasts want to be supervised, but my question is, how long do you want to make sure they're eating a nutritarian diet before you even engage in a fast? Well, that's a really good question because with a serious illness like psoriasis, lupus, asthma. Sure. I, I don't even usually, you know, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, like for example, I don't even like to take the med lower medications or to take away any of their, if they're on medications to suppress symptoms until they follow the diet for at least three months. So they're not even coming off medications for three months. Now I need usually, once they're, I start decreasing medications after three months. Now they're eating healthfully, and I'll slowly decrease the medications over the next, let's say, six months while they eat healthily. That's nine months. I've been decreasing medications for six months. The first three months I didn't, because it takes three to six months to get your levels of the cell density of nutrition to be very high. Mm -hmm. See, very few physicians or people understand these concepts of that the detox of the disease symptoms are the healing, are healing processes, number one, and number two, that we're talking about the nutrient density in the cells of the body. That's why I want the high nutrient density in the soil, because the nutrient density in the soil reflects the nutrient density in the food, which reflects the nutrient density in the person who eats the food. Like which, a food chain. It's a whole chain of, right? And nobody hardly understands this process. It's very few people. Um, I was just yeah. thinking that, you know, we're getting into all these specifics and obviously this is your craft. You're very knowledgeable about fasting, but for someone who has a serious health issue, how do they find a physician that they could supervise them? You can't do this on your own. You need someone that knows what they're doing. That's correct. There's very few doctors around the country that can that can do that do this. But it's it. I was just thinking too, like surgery, a, a more what I see as extreme procedure mm -hmm. is available at the ready. And yet fasting, it seems like you would have to do a lot of research and dig to find a, a knowledgeable doctor if you right. want to cure yourself that way. Right. And you know, I've um, in a sense, you know, have a lot of experience with four decades utilizing these protocols, helping people get well. And the most fascinating thing is the silence and lack of interest of the medical profession and other doctors, specialists, and even plant-based community, people who are, they don't have interest in asking, learning, inquiring 
of what I've done, what I've seen, what methods I've used, how long, like the questions you've asked me. Um, there's a few doctors I can mention. That, there that, are some. There are some who, who yeah. call me all the time and utilize my knowledge and, and my experience. And, yeah. and, have, and, and really got into fasting. And got into it and, 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 used, and have built onto that and worked with me on these things. Yeah. But, the, but I'm saying the, the surprising thing is the mass silence. You know, even despite that we publish articles and discuss this publicly, you know, tell, you know we're still the amazing thing is the lack of interest in the, in the health professional population about utilizing these natural approaches completely. They're interested in, you know, supplements, naturopathic, medicines, or herbal medications, you know, whatever they're interested in, some kind of fix they can give people, a pill, a magic pill. But people love popping pills. They love popping pills <laughs> or a magic answer, but something that involves yeah. diet change and fasting, whoa, that's two way out. You know, I uh, think not eating for two weeks scares people, like a lot. Like, yeah. I think that's a very foreign concept. I mean, we're taught from such a young age to like finish your plate, you need food, food, mm -hmm. food is good, food is fuel, and it is good, it is fuel, but I guess sometimes when you're trying to get out the toxins, you don't want it. Yes, I mean, that's right. What I'm saying here is that what's not understood by the general practitioners, including the naturopaths too, You'd think they, you know, they still don't understand that the, inf the inflammatory process being intertwined and part of the process of repair. And the inflammation serves to dilute, wall off, and remove the injurious agents, setting into motion a complex series of events that tries to heal and reconstitute damaged tissue. And so they see disease symptoms as something to suppress with poisons, as opposed to let their, the, the healing reaction complete itself so you can eventually get well. And me the medical profession is based on that concept of taking in poisons to suppress the natural detoxification process of the body, which manifests itself as symptoms. Right. You know, so they're very- Antibiotics, antiviral, is that what that does? No, they're using the auto these um, biological agents and chemotherapeutic agents to suppress, like prednisone, plaquinol, you know, you know, other drugs, the whole of armamentarium of medications, all the different medications, you know, that suppress inflammation, whether it's from rheumatoid arthritis to ulcerative colitis, they're taking these serious drugs that's of Imuran, they're suppressing inflammation. Mm -hmm. But it leads to the person more chronically being sick and never getting well and requiring more stronger drugs and have to be on drugs the rest of your life. So, so not so, dropping the illness and moving on. It doesn't, that's right. You can't drop the illness and move on as a normal person. You're, you're now stuck on poisonous drugs for the rest of your life, which is well known to shorten your lifespan, increase risk of cancer, and then you'll need more and more drugs in the future. And just to reiterate, you don't tell people who have an autoimmune condition or a serious condition to just drop the drugs completely. You wean them off slowly and it's medically supervised. And, and it may the... take a year to wean them off their drugs if they're healthy enough to be a cop to be able to accommodate that, right? right? So it may take a long time before even considering putting them on a fast. Right. But, the, but what we're talking about here too is the fact that um, even utilizing fasting more judiciously and not recommending most overweight people fast because it's not the most, it's not the most way to, that you get the, the best probability of the person is keeping their weight down long term. Right. You enhance the probability if you actually feed them correctly and they learn how to replicate that way of eating over time, tweak it so it's just the right amount for them and eventually adjust their taste to it and through repetition and adjustment and long term adherence with that way of eating, it increases the probability they're going to stay with that and quit this idea of yo-yo dieting to going too extreme as you, and also for a lot of these people who are food addicts you push calories down too low even with intermittent fasting and it, for them it triggers their desire to obsess about food and their desire to want to binge and now overeat on a binge diet because they restrict their calories too low that's why at the retreat that we have we keep people's caloric range in that narrow range between like 1100 and 1500 so they're adjusted for their individual needs. So we're trying to eat, to feed them a diet that they can enjoy, maintain long-term, and learn how to cook and eat that way when they go home. So they can continue on the same process when they go home to continue the weight loss process and learn to, live, to, learn to like this way and live this way long-term. Well, that's what I was just going to say is that's why I feel like you love the Eat to Live Retreat is because you have all the best food there to use food as your medicine when you want. Right. And then... You use fasting pretty rarely, but how many people at the retreat would you say you fast? Right, it gives me the option of fasting a person when I need to be. And supervising and them. I, and I can supervise them, but most of the people there are eating because I don't really, I'm very more judicious in my use of fasting. I feel like it's like two in a hundred that you end up fasting, or is it more than that? 
Maybe a little more than that. Yeah. Maybe like maybe I'm fasting. You know, one out of fifty people. One out of fifty. 50 yeah. 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 Because yeah. it's there for people who have serious illness. But a lot of these can also. A lot of these people get well off just food. That's correct. Most people Most. aren't that sick that they don't need to fast. Right. And I really want to want to cement in their long term health habits is much more important than getting faster results with a fast that they're not going to maintain. That which might sabotage my ability to guarantee them to have long term compliance and and without. I'm um, going back on eat, wanting to eat unhealthy food again. Because I've actually heard this from someone I was talking at, uh, to at the retreat. They said they don't eat all day. They're like super busy with work and just doing various things. So mm-hmm. it's overeating then is not an issue, but it's when they do eat, they open the floodgates and it's like they can't stop. So yeah. I think being too hungry is also a red flag that that's not really eating for health. You're not balancing out your meals. So you don't go into like crazy binge starving mode, right. which can be dangerous. It's why this concept of um, intermittent fasting, or where people go to a or time restricted eating, where they go to one day or one meal a day, also usually doesn't work effectively long term because they wind up eating, overeating, stretching out their stomach, and it's not good for their digestion or health. Trying to fit it all in all at, at one, one time. time and thinking maybe I'm going to be hungry later, so I better eat more now. Exactly. Yeah, and you know you interfere with the digestive efficiency the production of digestive enzymes, the bacterial, healthy bacteria, and the, so you get more indigestion and more slow digestion and more digesting without the proper enzymes. To so when you eat one meal and you overeat, you tax the digestive system and you don't digest as efficiently. So it's better to have two meals a day of more reasonable amount of calories or three meals a day if you're have highly physically active. And some women do better on two meals and some people do better on three meals, but I don't think it's very rare that a person would do better on one meal, but it could, you know, it's rare, but I don't really, I'm not trying to dissuade people against that. Right. We always talk about that big B word, the balance. And so I feel like it's, you never want to push yourself to either limit. You want to be just as comfortable looking forward to your next meal and not stuffed to the brim at the end of your meal. Exactly. That's when you know you're at that like sweet spot. You want to feel you had enough food. You're not stuffed. You're not uncomfortable, but you felt you're satisfied. Right. So I am I have to say I'm like a huge component of intermittent fasting. I love it. It's done so many wonders for me. A a huge proponent of it? Yeah. Did I say that? What did I say? You said a huge component. Oh, no. I'm a huge proponent of intermittent fasting. Um, I think it's done wonders for me, but it's such a... How do you utilize it? It's it's such an ambiguous word. Like, what does that exactly mean? Everyone defines it differently. But I stop eating early. I, it's so weird. I've never had any food or health issues my whole life, but there was this one period several years ago that I was getting really bad indigestion, acid reflux. And that's when I was like, I need to like change some things. And I just really stopped eating by like four, like pretty early, four or five. And I lost 10 pounds. My acid reflux went away without even trying. I was still enjoying food, going on with my day. I just really liked how light I felt when going to bed actually. And every single time I woke up, I wasn't even hungry which was really fascinating to me. I was just like, Mm. I felt at my best. So that's how I utilize it. And I just think it was very helpful and I still do it. Well, that's the way I, that's how I recommend people utilize intermittent fasting because it's always good to repeat this if people don't understand it totally is that most healing occurs during when you're sleeping at night and most weight loss occurs when you sleep at night. And when you get more sleep at night, when you get less sleep at night, you have a tendency to eat more during the day and gain more weight. Sleeping more makes you lose weight better. So we're saying I love sleeping. Yeah. We're <laughs> saying that, you know, so and then the these benefits we're talking about of sleeping, anti-aging, detox, healing, and more weight loss occurs during sleep. All those benefits occur more when you're not digesting food when you're sleeping. Mm. So the so you live longer. The most almost one of the most important things you do to live longer is be finish digesting food before you go to bed at night. So if you go to bed at ten o'clock, that means you can't eat food after six o'clock at night because it takes four hours to digest the last meal, usually. But if you eat too big of a meal, or if you eat, if you eat animal products, or you know, oils, or even just too much beans and nuts at night, too much volume, you'll still feel the digestion going on, because you could prolong digestion by the type of food you're eating, or by the overeating food, right? So, and I, and, and you'll, then you'll go to bed on the stomach, half the night you'll be digesting food, and you won't get the full benefit of your sleep. I was just gonna say, I swear it affects you too, because 
when I go to bed when I've overeaten or when I'm a bit too full, I don't sleep as well. Like I'm, I'm not kidding. When and so that's why I love intermittent fasting. I just feel like it made me feel healthier, better, stronger, more, more energy. Like all these little things. Yeah. I think from not digesting food at night and sleeping better. It's definitely good, but I don't know if the term. I personally wouldn't call it, call it intermittent eating? fasting because you're not really fasting. You're just eating a lighter and earlier dinner. Yeah. You know, it's more yeah. like time-restricted eating. And it's almost like the, one of the um, core goals of a nutritarian diet is not to eat heavy before you go to bed at night. Mm -hmm. but it's not fasting per se. You know right. What I, mean? it's I know. Like, it's funny too because some people are like calling their overnight fast if they're pushing it to 15 hours, which I do like every yeah, yeah. single night. Right. They're calling that Fast. fasting and they're even dropping the intermittent. So I'm like, wait, what are we talking about? I'm like, oh, so you're eating during the day. You're just not eating at night when you sleep and you're pushing that out. So like that's what yeah. I would call intermittent fasting, but you might call it something else. Yeah. So do you think it's ever dangerous or not a good thing to calorie like to time restricted eat or intermittent fast? Well, like I said, that um, you know, even I'm, even I struggle with that sometimes because sometimes you, You're I might not perfect. I might overeat at dinner. You know, the chefs are making all these foods, and I want to have like a second dessert or have an extra helping. I have like two good tasting food around me, mm -hmm. and I'm eating overeating at night, and I feel oh shoot, I overeat, and now mm -hmm. I'm going to bed at night, and I feel it in my stomach. I feel you like know, people I, would not believe me if I told them how much you enjoyed food, like yeah. how much you are a foodie, <laughs> secret foodie. <laughs> They'd be like, "You're wrong." He tells me to eat broccoli all the time. I'm like, he loves broccoli. Well, anyway, so once in a while I'm saying, oh, damn, I, I ate too much food tonight. I shouldn't yeah. have eaten that much. So I'm in the same process as everybody else. I'm trying to keep my dinner so it's not, so I don't want to eat something after dinner. And also, so I didn't overeat at dinner, mm -hmm. you know, because the food tastes too good. You want to eat more of it, you know? Well, it's funny. Just because me and you are black belt nutritarians doesn't mean we don't think about it. It's not yeah. like it's thoughtless for us. We are saying like, oh, you know, you do, I'm going to go on a walk after dinner so I don't overeat. Or I'm yeah. going to try to stop eating by five. I am minding the clock, like stuff yeah. like that. We do little things to help us to like make us sleep better, age slower, all the all the good stuff. So Trying our best, but we're not perfect. Mm -hmm. It's like yeah. a hobby. Yeah, you it's work a hobby. At you, it. do, you work at it. You try to yeah. do the best you can. Yeah, and when you, yeah. the more you do it, the better at it you get and the easier it gets. That's correct. But it's not like we're just like machines. So Yes, right. You're so, still tempted sometimes to eat late at night or to eat sort of eat something else or to eat more food and we got to try to but the most important thing is is, is at nighttime is the time when you want to be most controlled mm -hmm. because that's the most important time not to overeat. Right. So mm -hmm. I know we get this question so many times and people are like can I skip my breakfast and just yeah. to reiterate that's where you'd say it's better not to skip breakfast or but sometimes you can eat breakfast like I'll go I'll wake up in the morning and I'll go to the gym. Or I'll go for a or I'll go for a run. Or I'm going at, or I'll get back from playing tennis. I don't get back till ten o'clock in the morning. Let's say and I'll eat breakfast at ten thirty or eleven o'clock. Mm -hmm. Well, that day I'm not going to eat lunch at twelve. I just ate breakfast lunch at eleven at ten o'clock. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to eat I'm going to eat lunch at three or four o'clock. And that means it's the last meal of the day. So I ate two meals that day. But the next morning I woke up because I ate dinner at three or four o'clock. And I, I exercised a lot the day before. Maybe we did spend a lot of time in the gym. So the next morning at seven thirty or seven o'clock I'm hungry. So I'm going to eat early. Because I'm hungry, because I ate an earlier dinner the night before. So I might sometimes do two meal a day days, and sometimes eat an early breakfast. But the bottom line is that if you're skipping breakfast and then eating late at night and eating more calories later in the day, it's not a good idea. You're better off because you don't really benefit from skipping breakfast as much as you benefit from skipping dinner or eating a lighter dinner. Right. You benefit from eating a lighter dinner. You don't benefit from extracting extending the fast into the day is not as that very beneficial it's beneficial from extending your nighttime you know pushing your eating early in the day and you burn more calories in the day you your metabolism is higher during the day when you when you're so when you're eating when your metabolism is higher you're burning more calories when you're eating when your metabolism is slower in the evening and at night you're just putting more calories into fat storage right so, I mean, your advice to people is to detox, eat a healthy diet, learn learn to love the right foods, and choose the right foods for you and for your health. And then mm -hmm. you have this concept of intuitive eating, So, and which our definition, I feel like, is so different than other people's. But it's really listening to your body once you've detoxed to eat the right amount, know when you're hungry, and right. feel good, right? Correct. So how else would you utilize intuitive eating? Did I miss anything? Well, I utilize intuitive eating because one of the symptoms of true hunger is enhanced taste sensation. The food actually tastes better. So we can get people to realize how good this can taste. If they don't overeat at breakfast, it's going to make the lunch taste better. And if they don't overeat at lunch and they get hungry before dinner, the dinner is going to taste better and they're going to enjoy eating more. 
So if you're chronically stuffing yourself and trying to get too much sensation of caloric overstimulating with calories, then the next meal becomes, um, you, you don't have as much desire to eat and as much enjoyment with eating. So overeating leads to less enjoyment with eating. Mm -hmm. So we're enhancing our enjoyment by beating, in, eating more the instinctually right amount of calories and trying to get a little hungry and adjusting our calories so we actually feel, oh, I'm hungry for dinner. I really want to eat dinner. Mm -hmm. You enjoy dinner more. Right. So, I'm, so we're toying with that because people say, oh, I'm never hungry. Well, if you're never hungry, you're probably chronically overeating because you have to like eat le little enough so you can feel hungry once in a while so you know that that's about, you're hitting them, you're closer to the right amount of calories you need. I actually, when I work with people and coach them, I hear that a lot. They're like, but I'm not hungry for this. I'm not hungry for that, but I need to eat. And it's funny how often you have to tell them, don't force yourself to eat because they are instinctually led to believe that they should be forcing themselves to eat this amount, this amount, this amount, rather than just listening to them, their bodies. And, eating, and they're eating by the clock. And that's what the other thing with, with um, intermittent fasting, they're kind of like eating by the clock and forcing low calories when they're hungry and they're, and they're not really learning what, to listen to the body. And if you get healthy enough, eating a healthy enough diet, you can listen to the body because the body will kind of attract, um, direct you to the right amount of calories. Mm -hmm. So I'm not artificially eating less calories than I want. I just want, mostly I want the right amount of calories and I'm not comfortably overeating or eating too many calories. So my mm -hmm. body weight is a good weight because I'm eating as much food as I feel like eating. It's the right amount for my body. Mm -hmm. And it yeah. just leads you to an appropriate weight. It leads you to an appropriate weight. Correct. And you always say hunger is the best sauce. So you, if mm -hmm. you're not hungry for the next meal, that makes perfect sense that it wouldn't taste as good and your body's not really wanting it. Correct, yeah. So you're not going to get too thin or it's just going to lead you to that weight that you should be. And you digest the food better because if you're chronically overeating, you're like almost con chronically stressing your digestive enzymes. And now you're not going to digest food as well, get more bloating. And some people have lower digestive capacity. And the more they chronically overeat, it cripes their digestive capacity, always stressed out, and they don't digest as well. By under eating just a little bit, or cutting their calories back a little bit and chewing better, they start to get better digestion. Wow, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. So do we have time to answer a few member questions? Sure, let's okay, do it. Okay, great. I think I memorized them, but if not, I'll look at my phone. Okay. First question, a person's doctor told them that they're not getting enough calcium from the vegetarian diet and that you, the doctor needs to interpret the level of calcium. You can't just see it from a blood test. Is that true? And how does someone get enough calcium? Um, yes, it's a good question um, because the calcium and the blood test does not tell the calcium the person needs. So if the calcium in the blood test is normal, it doesn't mean your body intake of calcium is normal. You could be losing calcium in the urine, being a negative balance, developing osteoporosis from weak bones and developing weak bones. So and you your can't calcium, tell calcium in the bones. You can't tell calcium in the urine, um, in the blood, excuse me. So if the, if the calcium is low in the blood, it's because your protein is low in the blood and because your body proteins hold on to calcium. So, so, but, but a nutritarian diet contains plant foods that are rich in calcium. So this person- like what? Is, this person doesn't even know what a nutritarian diet is, this doctor, because, yeah. So we're talking about beans and nuts and seeds and green vegetables. A nutritarian diet is the diet that recommends beans, nuts and seeds, and green vegetable. It's a high calcium plant-based diet. And this doctor may have been referring to a study that came out of England showing that vegans had higher rates, had weaker bones, and higher rates of osteoporosis. And I did a blog on that at drfirma.com. I showed that the vegan diet that was documented in that study that people were following were not based on beans and nuts and seeds and green vegetables like a nutritarian diet. Mm -hmm. And it, had, it was low in protein because they were eating a lot of bread and pasta and oils. White, white flour, white flour yeah. rice. And also it was, low in pro, it was low in protein and it was low in calcium. And I showed an analysis of a nutritarian diet next to a, next to a, like a high carbohydrate or low fat plant-based um, vegan diet. And it showed that the nutritarian diet had double the calcium and double the protein, almost, almost double the protein of this diet because we eat at these high calcium, higher protein foods. And didn't you tell me something that animal products don't even help calcium much because it makes you excrete more in the urine? That's right. When people are generally eating animal products three times a day, like they are, it creates more acid in the body. And to get rid of the acid, the body is ur urinating excess calcium. Oh. So you're, you're urinating out more calcium, so your calcium requirements are higher. So you have a higher calcium requirement on a meat-based or animal product-based diet where you're eating animal products more regularly, whereas in a nutritarian diet, which is plant-based or you're eating um, 
either on totally plants or you're eating a small amount of animal products below the range which you're going to overly acidify the blood so you're not going to dump calcium in the urine. So, so do vegetarians need to supplement with calcium? They generally don't except some thinner and frail women as they age have because they're smaller their intake of food is smaller and because their intake of food is smaller and the bioavailability of calcium, the digestibility of calcium goes down with aging. So women over the age of 65, 70, um, who are, could develop, so we're giving them or we recommend a small amount of extra calcium, food-based calcium with, the, with a meal or with each meal, as opposed to a large calcium supplement like 500 or 1,000 milligrams at one time, which have been shown in scientific studies to increase cardiovascular problems because you get calcification deposits in soft tissue or in the heart that could be bad for a person. Oh, wow. So it's not good to take a lot of calcium at one time. But there is a benefit for a person who has a tendency to have osteopenia or osteoporosis to take as postmenopausally to take a little bit of food derived calcium a small amount of you know 100 150 just to add a, just to top off a little extra calcium in that meal to to make up for the loss of bioavailability that aging happened for the lower absorption of calcium to help strengthen or maintain her bone mass. So there's some indication where we give people calcium supplements but we do so with in smaller amounts more frequently and we try to use a food-based calcium, not just a, ba a plain mineral calcium. And then we also give other accessory nutrients like K2 and to make sure the K2 and the vitamin D are adequate. So we're using right. it as to make sure women's bones stay strong. But keeping in mind that the most important thing for building bones is being strong and building muscle. Is keeping your bone, your muscles, your bones strong is keeping your muscles strong. So of course, keeping exercising throughout your whole life. It's going to really help with that. And help with calcium retention and calcium absorption too. Cool. All right, next question. Is the keto diet good for you? Does it have any benefits at all? What about for someone who's diabetic? Right, well, um, the keto diet is usually a diet that's higher in animal products, but the hallmark of a keto diet is carbohydrate restriction. And they're carbohydrate restricting sufficiently to keep the person in chronic ketosis. So the which body, we went over. Which we went over a little bit. So, mm -hmm. the, so the body is it. now in the, is learning how to live on ketones as an alternative or emergency flu fuel, but it keeps the body in a chronic state of acidosis. And the question is, it may help a person lose weight, drop their blood pressure, lower their triglycerides, and even improve their glucose on their diabetes. But so does a nutritarian diet also does that through a different mechanism, because the high fat intake on a ketogenic diet distorts the structure and function of insulin receptors. So now they have to carbohydrate restrict because if they eat carbohydrate, they get a higher insulin response. Insulin doesn't work as well, and they get more glucose response in the blood in response to a carbohydrate. So wait, just, just to make sure I'm understanding this correctly, you're saying because they don't use insulin because they're not taking in as much carbohydrates, the insulin receptors then become like weakened in a way or not no. used? No, no. I'm saying because um, their, their diet is generally higher in saturated fat, which is found in animal products, that saturated fat infiltrates the insulin receptor and distorts its shape and function. Oh, so it's so the, the saturated fat distorting it. Distorting the function oh. and structure of the insulin receptor. So now the person on the keto diet says, look, I can't eat oatmeal or a mango because my sugars go through the roof. Well, your sugars go through the roof because you're eating all that fat. If you're mm -hmm. on a nutritarian diet and you had, which is a lower saturated fat and you're in and lower body fat, you're, and you were eating a diet that's glycemically favorable, but not no glycemic, not, no glucose, or not as low as that, then your sugars can come back to normal. Because look, if a person goes on a fast to lose weight, but they go off the fast and eats, gains a lot of weight back, it's no good because they regain the weight back again. If the person that goes on a keto diet and sees some benefit, they can't maintain it long term. Because after you maintain it long term, you're going to result in dramatic increased risk of cancer and heart attack deaths. Because we have numerous studies today that show that keto diets maintained long term lead to a higher risk of premature death. Premature death or deaths before the age of 70, generally speaking. Wow. So we have a we actually have a dose-dependent relationship between animal protein intake and premature death. Diets higher in animal protein lead to increased risk of premature death. So these keto diets, paleo diets, carnivore diets are increasing a person's risk of premature death. So the person says, well, I'm, I'm just doing it short term to control my glucose. I'm going to go back to eating healthy vegetables again. But no, because as soon as you go back off the diet, you gain the weight back, the diabetes comes back, the, all the problems. So you, so you yo-yo your weight, and any time you go from one way of dieting to another way of dieting, it causes a, a stress in the body, and you, and you flood the body with more saturated fats. 
Because that's it, what's scary, I think, is seeing those benefits and people being so hooked on the short-term benefits. You know, they're looking better. They're thinking their, like, muscles are showing and yeah. they just feel good and they have nothing bad to say about it. But I keep looking at macros, like carbohydrates, fat, and protein, and, like, you just depleting one of those. Like, it's throwing your body that's into right. kind of a warped safety net is what I always thought. Yes, it's not. it doesn't work long-term, well, because it's, it's not good for their health, but we know particularly the that diets below 30% of carbohydrate, and that's what these most of these keto and paleo are aiming for, those are the diets that restrict carbohydrates to that degree that see a heightened, a much higher rate of early life deaths as you, as you extreme the, the carbohydrate. They try to cut carbohydrates out more, lower and lower to get more weight loss and get more benefits, and in doing so, it's like smoking cigarettes to lose weight. You can smoke cigarettes, you can snort cocaine, you can take amphetamines, you can take drugs to lose weight. But, there's, but these are like, these fads and these gimmicks to lose weight are not healthy ways to lose weight. Whereas a nutritarian diet, we're having people eat more vegetables to lose weight. Mm -hmm. And vegetables are low calorie. Mm -hmm. and more zucchini, more eggplant, more mushrooms, more onions, more tomatoes, more, you know, more berries, more wild blueberries, more things that are actually lower in calories. They're relatively low glycemic. And with a little bit of beans and nuts, are have, nuts are, are, um, have no glycemic effect. Mm -hmm. So we're, t we're making the diet favorable. Eat your vegetables, folks. Yeah. You heard it here first. And you know, there is some research benefits for ketogenic diets with regard to people with brain tumors. So there are on some cancers that are responsive to diets for taking away the glucose, doesn't allow the tumor to grow. Not with general cancers, but with brain tumors. And I've had some patients with brain tumors that I've treated, and I've made them diets that were kind of like plant-based keto diets to restrict glucose further than a nutritarian diet to but get more protection. But not in the state of keto diet? Well, like not as many animal products as keto diet oh, okay. because the saturated fats and the proteins could negate the benefits of the, keto, of the lack of glucose. Sure. So, so then I gave them a diet high in avocado, and in those cases, we're giving a diet with more nuts, with more avocado, with more vegetables, and, and trying Have to use... Have you seen success? Well, I definitely saw that we, I think I prolonged this person's life and we slowed the brain cancer down. And they, this person I'm referring to who I use this with is, is deceased. She passed away. But I definitely think that um, her death would have been accelerated. And she, I think she lived five years longer because of the, what we did, how we worked with her. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Oh, wow. Yeah. All right. Last question, which I do not remember. So let me mm -hmm. check my notes. Are protein powders good for you? We well, had to check your notes on that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Two is all I can remember. Okay. okay, okay. Uh, well, again, um, this, what we find from the scientific literature is that eating more plant-based proteins from real food extends human lifespan. And so the low protein plant foods would be things like rice and fruit, let's say the higher pro. So eating a fruitarian diet, that's mostly all fruit would not be ideal for maximized longevity because it's not high enough in protein because protein bioavailability goes down with aging. So paying attention to protein adequacy with plant foods is important. Mm -hmm. And the foods that are on the plant foods that have the most protein are the ones we just keep mentioning that have the most calcium. Let me, let me try to do it. Beans, nuts and seeds, green and vegetables. That's, that's it, right, <laughs> right. Those three foods, beans, nuts and seeds, and green vegetables, so, and when you mix them all three together at the meal, when you have some greens and some beans and some nuts and seeds, the same meal, you get the most efficiency of protein utilization and people get satiated. So they don't really have to want to eat, crave and eat, overeat food. Yeah. I love that part. Right. So it's really important to have a, a you know, a little bit of bean and a little bit of nuts and seeds with that meal, a little bit of greens is particularly helpful for people with who have a tendency to really want to um, binge keeps them from wanting to binge food. Mm -hmm. They're just having a fruit meal, let's say. Right. Or just a salad. Yeah, it doesn't, salad, it, doesn't it, doesn't satiate. it doesn't satiate them. A little bit of beans, even way. a little bit of beans, a little bit of nuts helps satiate them. So they're not going to want to binge after the meal. They're sure. more compliant. For sure. And then, but the question is, are there some people as they get older whose protein bioavailability goes down to the degree that a little extra protein could help them? And the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. And it's an individual basis. So some people over the age of 80 might require a little extra protein, but we don't want people to supplement with whey protein, dairy protein, or isolated soy protein, because those proteins are just too concentrated and they raise IGF-1 too much, which could increase cell replication leading to cancer. We'd much rather they eat a pea protein or a hemp seed protein or just hemp seeds. Aren't, just more. Yeah, aren't those foods also processed? Yes, yeah. they're highly processed. So it's like, for me, I always like to know what's in my protein powder. I mean, you're talking about a protein powder like yours, like the ProBoost that has these real foods or extractions from real foods that right. you can read. Right. If it's all like protein isolate or weird words like that, that my red flag starts to go up. 
Exactly. And we want people to recognize they're getting most of the protein from the food. They're not trying to use any kind of protein powder to try to think that that's going to be their major source of protein. They've got to eat the right food. Mm -hmm. And the right food is don't get most of your protein through animal products. Get it from these healthy plants we're talking about. And if you need it more, because you need more because you're a professional athlete, you're a heavy, serious weightlifter, that, like uh, me. or an athlete like you and I, or, or a person who's elderly and getting too frail, then we're going to use a healthy, more, more natural food-based pre-protein and hemp seeds. Mm -hmm. you know, not, to get it from the good stuff. Get it from, right, not from something like an isolated soy protein or whey protein powder. Cool. That was a fun talk about fasting. This hand. Oh, <laughs> don't give me your bad rest. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. See you next time. Be healthy. Stay on it. And live good.